If you're new to Christian things, not yet a follower of Jesus, you may well be hearing this and thinking, these words from the Apostle Paul, they are now my confirmation of what I have suspected all along, that Christianity is out of touch, it is unworkable, it is actually quite wrong, it is frankly harmful. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. I'm Steve Hiller and Jonathan, I'm glad that you actually acknowledged that and brought that up because I think sometimes that is an argument that we sometimes hear from those who don't know Jesus, who don't really understand the Bible and the gospel message. So if we are followers of Jesus and someone comes to us with that sort of argument, how do you begin to respond to that? Well, what I think I want to do is go right back to basics and acknowledge the fact that the Bible teaches that God is our creator. He, he made us, and we are his creatures, and he sets out a design for life in his world and life for his people, which is his design, and it's wonderful and beautiful and good, but it's in many ways countercultural. It, it sometimes feels almost otherworldly, and we will sometimes bump up against that and, and think that certain things that the Bible teaches are strange or even unpalatable. But the Bible calls us to hear God's voice, to listen to his design for life on this earth, and to recognize its goodness. And what I have found and what other believers find is that God's God's vision for human life, his, his calling for humanity is a wonderful calling, but it is, it is different from the visions of human life and flourishing that are set out by so many in our society. But I'd, I'd urge you, if Christian things are new to you, listen to what the Bible says and reckon with God's calling and God's design. And I, I believe you'll find that, that it, is, it is beautiful and good. Well, we're going to open our Bibles together to the book of Titus. Chapter 2 is where we're going to be at today, looking at the first 10 verses there. Let's continue our message, Adorning the Doctrine of God. Here is Jonathan. Next, the younger women. Younger women need to learn from the older women to be trained, verse 4, to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. I think these two verses, verses 4 and 5 of Titus chapter 2, are among the most controversial, probably least politically correct in all the Bible. We only need to scan them, don't we? to see how very far out of step they feel with our times. I remember some years ago, I was due to be speaking for a number of days at a, at a seminary in another city, a, a city actually that has a particular reputation, a world reputation for being forward-looking, maybe a little left-leaning, socially progressive. A friend who is a pastor of a well-known church in that city heard that I was coming to town and kindly invited me to come and preach for him the Sunday that I was gonna be there. I was very happy to accept that. I was thankful for the offer. He mentioned that they were doing a series in, in Titus, just working through. He asked, you know, would you be happy just to fit in within the series? I said, of course, I'd be glad to do that. He then told me, you know, we're in chapter two, and he'd like me to speak on these particular verses. <laughs> and I realized at that moment how clever he was. I had been painted into a corner. It was, of course, a stroke of pure genius to get a guest preacher to tackle these verses, to say the uncomfortable things, and then later that afternoon or whatever to get on a plane and leave the country. <laughs> Even as I say this, I'm feeling a little silly for having booked Pastor Dave to preach next Sunday and uh, not this Sunday. <laughs> but we all feel the tension, don't we? We sense the awkwardness here. Paul is setting out a particular vision for godliness for the younger woman, a vision that is distinctly and unashamedly feminine, distinct from what he might say, and in fact what he does say to a younger man. And frankly, we read it and we don't immediately know what to do with this. We hear Paul's words in verses 4 and 5, and they, they sound as though they come, frankly, from another universe. If you're new to Christian things, not yet a follower of Jesus, you may well be reading this and hearing this and thinking, these words from the Apostle Paul, they are now my confirmation of what I have suspected all along, that Christianity is out of touch, it is unworkable, it is actually quite wrong, it is frankly harmful. Okay, these are all the priors we bring, right? But I want us now to slow down and actually listen 
to what Paul has to say. He insists at the end of verse 3 that what the older women have to teach the younger women is good. That's the way he characterizes it, thoroughly good, entirely wholesome. And here's the substance of it. For those younger women, for the younger woman who is married, who has children, she is called to love her husband and children. And right there, the culture would say to Paul, that's patronizing. That's such a small, such a narrow vision. But again, let's think about it for a second. For a younger woman who is married, who has children, if that's you, what is the most important thing in your life? Apart from the Lord himself, what's the most important thing? What, what's the thing above all other things that will matter most to you when you come to the end of your life and all is said and done? When you re reflect on all the investments of time and energy you have made in life, isn't it your immediate family? Isn't that the most important thing? If you succeed in all other things, but your husband doesn't sense your love, your kids don't know your love, isn't that a tragedy? beyond all tragedies. But if you reach the end of your life, and maybe you don't have the longest list of glittering worldly achievements, but your husband has known your devotion, your kids have grown up really secure in your love, I want to say, whatever the world will say, I want to say that you have had a very rich and a very fruitful, you have had a wonderful life. Isn't that right? At the end of the day, Let's forget our cultural prejudices. Isn't that what matters most? The world might call that a very small vision, but the Lord esteems this. He prizes these relationships, loving husband and children for the younger Christian woman. It's at the heart of godliness. This goes together with being self-controlled, verse 5. Actually, loving the less than perfect husband and loving him well, loving, exasperating, tiring, maybe sometimes difficult children and loving them well, that is actually going to take some self-control. I think that's why this is paired here. And it goes with purity too, Paul tells us. I guess sexual purity is at the heart of what Paul has in mind here, even if it implies a wider moral purity of life too. We know that there's no quicker way to break down the loving bonds of marriage and a home than through infidelity, so it is all tied together, isn't it? Next, Paul commends the honor and value of working at home, and at this moment, we wince just a little bit. Paul, why did you have to say that? That's so awkward. That's so uncomfortable, and we fear, don't we? This is a throwback to, I don't know, the 1950s or something. We, we picture, uh, we envision a housewife feeling chained to the kitchen sink, and, and we think of that image that Western society has been at such pains to dismantle and to set aside over recent decades. Many women played a productive role in the economic world of Paul's day, often actually through cottage industries based in the home. And I, I don't think we should read this and push it so far that we say women cannot work or earn money or have a career. We, we shouldn't push Paul to be saying that. I don't think he's saying that. Two things are pretty clear from this one word that's translated busy at home, and I think both are here. First, Paul is urging that younger women should lead productive lives, busy and not idle, but second, I think he urges them to be investing specifically in the home, not ignoring the home or despising the home. I think both those things are here in the text. I think both are important. Now, for many Christian women, for many here and many listening, you do have a career outside the home. And frankly, whatever preferences you may or may not have about working outside the home, the bottom line is this, your paycheck is an economic necessity and not up for negotiation in any way. If the mortgage is going to be paid, if there is going to be a home to invest in, you need actually to go out to work. That's the reality for very, very many. Not everyone, but many. And I don't think we should be reading this verse, verse five, as saying that's wrong, that's ungodly, you should feel guilty about that or something. But at the same time, Paul is saying there is a rightful concern for the younger Christian woman for home. There is a godly priority here for wife and mother, and ignoring home either through being unproductive, and that's possible, or being absent and uninterested, disengaged, and that's possible too. That's not the model of godliness that Paul is setting out here. And at this point, we do have to acknowledge, we do have to highlight a major difference. We've got to just recognize this. We can't, we can't paint it over and gloss it over. We have to highlight a major difference between the outlook of the Bible at this point and the outlook of our society. 
I think it's fair to say that our society really looks down upon the woman who chooses not to fully pursue the career she could have, who in some ways limits curtails, sacrifices some worldly ambitions, who chooses to invest energy and time in the home to make caring for the family a core part of her vocation, who makes some sacrifices to maximize this investment in the family. Our society basically has very, very little respect for that investment now. And, and I, I know, because I've had some of these conversations, I know that for many Christian women who make some hard choices out of reverence for Scripture, having considered this passage, who make some hard choices and some trade-offs to invest in family, to invest in home, to honor the Lord, many ultimately feel pretty looked down upon for having done that. Struggle with that. But we need to say, we need to acknowledge together, listening to Scripture, we need to say that in the eyes of the Lord... According to what we see in verse 5, we need to say to you, if that's your situation, your investment in your family, whatever that looks like in your situation, whatever balances and trade-offs you've had to make, your investment in your family, the cost that you are bearing for that, it is dignified. The world will not dignify that, but in the church we dignify it. It is honorable. It is precious. It is worthy. The world will not honor that but as a church, we honor it. With this, integral to this, is kindness. Middle of verse 5. You know, this investment in home, it is such hard work. It flows from kindness, of course, but, but the slog of serving at home, often uncelebrated in some ways, day in, day out, it can drain and it can strain that kindness just a little bit. And so Paul gives the reminder, not not to set aside kindness in domestic service and industry, but to maintain kindness. And that's actually no small challenge, day in, day out, with fatigue and exhaustion and all the rest of it. It takes the Spirit's help. Finally, Paul gives the encouragement for the younger woman to honor the leadership of her husband. The older women are to teach the younger women to be submissive to their own husbands, middle of verse 5. Now, if we weren't unsettled enough by what Paul has to say here, this might be the breaking point for some. How do we read and process this? Well, we need to acknowledge that this is a point that Paul, here in Titus 2, he states it very briefly, but he doesn't develop it within this passage. It is just a mention here in Titus 2. It is part of Paul's wider theology of marriage, and it's a rich theology, but it's simply not expanded upon here. To see the bigger picture, we would need to take some time that we don't have today. We would need to take some time to dig into some other passages of Scripture, particularly Ephesians chapter 5. And I would encourage you to go and read Ephesians 5 if these are things you're grappling with and working through as you process this. But it's important here, just briefly, to recognize and to say that Paul's not commending here a kind of doormat mentality for the Christian wife as someone just to be walked over. We might fear that a little bit when we read language of submission, but that's not the vision that's cast, not at all. The Bible is actually so clear, profoundly clear from its opening chapter and all the way through that men and women are created equal in the image of God, equal in dignity and worth. And the bigger picture that Paul paints for Christian marriage is of a dynamic relationship between husband and wife where actually what he says elsewhere is that the husband lays down his life for his wife, even as Christ laid down his life for the church. And in the context of radical, self-giving, self-sacrificial love like that, the wife is called upon to respond to this servant leadership of a loving husband. There are two sides to this, both involving cost and radical love and profound sacrifice, both immensely challenging. But that's the model. And we know that it's not lived out perfectly in any marriage here on earth. And yet, this is what a Christian couple strive for, despite failings of both husband and wife. This is what the young Christian woman, in particular here now, is called to, and it's for a purpose. End of verse 5. That the Word of God may not be reviled. You know, society is watching. <laughs> Friends, neighbors, colleagues, unconverted family, and other believers too. And the reputation, ultimately, of the Word of God is at stake. Will the believer, even if the world doesn't agree with the way we choose to live, they will notice how we live. Will the believer seek to live out a distinctive kind of marriage, honoring God's instruction in the midst of a society that marches to the beat of a totally different drum? 
And of course, the Christian wife who lives this way, who pursues these totally countercultural but profoundly godly patterns of life by the help of the Spirit of God, the woman who does this, she will say something profound about the goodness of the Word of God. She will radiate a godliness that cannot actually be missed. She will cause God's Word not to be reviled, but to be honored by those around her. Now, that's younger women living out what accords with sound doctrine. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths and a message called Adorning the Doctrine of God. Well, we've been taking a look at what Paul gives, what kind of direction he gives to younger women. In just a moment, we're going to come back and see how he now turns his attention to younger men. But if you ever miss a broadcast in the series or you want to go back and listen to something again, you can always do that by coming to our website. You can stream the program or download an MP3. Our website address is EncounterTheTruth.org. You can also listen on the go if you have the Encounter the Truth app. Simply look for it at your favorite app store. Well, if you did join us a little late, we're in the book of Titus, chapter 2, as we get back to our message, Adorning the Doctrine of God. Here is Jonathan. Paul now turns to younger men. And in essence, he actually has one thing to say to them, verse 6. Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Now, in some ways, it seems rather odd that the instruction to younger men should be so short and sharp compared to the instructions to younger women. It's true that Paul will say more to Titus specifically as a young man in vocational ministry in verses 7 and 8, and we, we won't have time to look at that in detail. But in essence, Paul's word to the younger men is very simple. His admonition is brief. They must learn self-control. Now, in his brevity, we might think that Paul's kind of letting them off the hook, but he's not doing that at all, far from it. He knows that this is the very thing, this is the hardest thing that young men need to learn. I think I mentioned some time ago that I managed to give myself a a pretty good back injury. It's much better now, for which I'm thankful. But what happened was I was actually trying to, um, I was trying to move a shed in our yard. It was in a bad location, and there was no one around to help. But I figured, you know, I could probably, it was 10 by 10 or something, I figured I could probably just heave it up and drag it, (laughs) and then move the foundation stones myself. Anyway, it may not shock you to hear that it didn't go entirely according to plan. Uh, When it happened, I had a conversation with an orthopedic surgeon, and he reviewed what had taken place, and and he assured me, you know, I I think you're going to make a pretty good recovery and so on. And he, he further assured me that while an injury of this kind is common among young people, kind of my age, it becomes much less common among older people. He assured me, you know, you're, you're unlikely to have this kind of an injury uh, again. And I, I was very fascinated by that. You know, does the back get tougher or something? I thought it kind of degenerates over time. I couldn't make sense of it. And so I asked him, you know, why is it that you say these injuries, they decrease with age? I would have thought these things become more common. And he said to me, without a hint of any irony or a pause, he said, this doesn't happen when you get older because you get less stupid. <laughs> <laughs> you do this once. <laughs> you do this once as you have, and you learn your lesson, and you don't try it again. And he said, older people don't do this. They've learned. The truth of the matter is young men do some stupid things. Ask your car insurance company if you want to find out about that. It, rates for younger men are high, and they are high for a reason. Young men struggle with self-control. Self-control with uh, food and drinks. Uh, sexual Self-control, our pornography epidemic at the present time, confirms that in a very, very startling way. Self-control, getting to bed at night, getting up in the morning. Self-control in speech, in use of money. I could go on. Self-control is the younger man's battle, and Paul knows it. I remember when I went to university and I was involved in a very great church and part of a good Christian community, one of the things that had the greatest impact on me as a 19-year-old or whatever was getting to know a group of young men, some a little bit older than me, who seemed to me, and I just noticed this about them and I remarked to other people, they seemed to be really serious about self-control. Their Christian discipleship was marked by a kind of discipline, a, a disciplined approach to reading God's Word each day, to serving in ministry, to giving prayerful focus to evangelism at university, uh, to the use of their time, and so on. I saw it. I observed this. And I thought to myself, that's what I I want to pursue in the Christian life. Made a very, very deep impression on me. So let me speak to the younger men here for a moment and simply say this. Your Christian witness and your Christian growth and your Christian testimony largely stand or fall on this, your self-control. How is your self-control going? 
How are you growing in it and making progress in it? Who have you put around you to encourage you to grow in self-control, to keep you accountable to some degree in self-control? See, it is the great priority for you as a younger Christian man. Focus on that with the help of the Spirit of God. Titus is a young man in ministry, and Paul has particular encouragement for him in verses 7 and 8. We simply don't have time to give to that, but if you're a younger elder or pastor here, that's your homework today, to take that away, read and digest those verses. But we finish now with the bond servants, and here I want to speak to employees, to paid workers. Obviously, Paul is addressing a context where many were slaves. He was not commending slavery, but that was the historical reality in which he was operating. A vast number of people were bond servants in the Roman world. That was at the very heart of the economic system. And so when Paul thought about the Christian at work, the Christian in employment, this was a characteristic way to speak about it. Can't delve into the structure of the system at the moment, but we can look at the principles briefly that Paul gives us for the world of work. Notice with me, verse 9. Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior. Many listening are company owners, managers of employees. And for, I think, quite obvious reasons, we don't often hear from owners and employers of the challenges they face. It's a little bit awkward, actually, to speak about that. But when employers open up and share, as some have with me, the main challenge I think they often face is staff management. If you want to ask an employer or a manager what it is that puts gray hairs on their head, what stresses them out, what wears them out, it is normally this, dealing with difficult employees, 100%. Yeah, people who, who just won't do what they're asked to do. People who produce poor quality work. Em employees who argue all the time, who just resist leadership. W workers who are dishonest, who steal time or money from the company. Employers generally don't share those struggles too publicly, but they are very real. But to employ a Christian, <laughs> to employ one of us here, it should be such a joy, such a pleasure such an otherworldly counter-cultural experience. You see, because we belong to Jesus and Jesus is our master, we should be those who know something about submission and who, for his sake, are submissive to them, even if they're not the greatest boss, who seek to please the boss with our quality of work, who don't argue back all the time and wear the boss down, even if we don't agree. Those who never take what isn't ours, but show good faith, perfect integrity in all things. We should be an absolute delight to employ if we belong to Jesus. That's the bottom line. And here's the purpose, and it's so beautifully put, so that in everything we may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. The work of a fine jeweler is to find a jewel that will complement and enhance the beauty of an already beautiful person so that her loveliness is shown to be more lovely by the diamond or, or whatever it is. You know, the doctrine of God is beautiful. The gospel is glitteringly glorious. And when you and I go to work and behave like this, serve like this, we put a diamond on the gospel. And for anyone who would pay attention, their eye is drawn to see the beauty of a Savior who gave himself to redeem a sinful people and to make them new, to make them his very own, to make them glitter and shine in a dark and darkening world. Friends, our great need today is not simply to know sound doctrine. We need to know it, of course. Our great need is to live in accordance with that doctrine, to live in a way that resonates with that doctrine that's not out of tune, that doesn't detract from it, but rather makes the gospel of our salvation glitter and shine in this dark and darkening world. Jonathan Griffiths here on Encounter the Truth, really helping us see how we need to apply the gospel to our everyday lives and taking a look at the book of Titus in chapter 2 where Paul breaks down the church into age groups and tells each one what godly living looks like. If you want to go back and listen to this broadcast or any broadcast in the series again, you can do that by coming to our website. It's EncounterTheTruth.org. And we're able to bring you this program because of your generosity. To find out how you can help make sure that Jonathan's teaching stays on this station each day, 
visit our website, EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, for Jonathan and our producer, Mark Breda, I'm Steve Hiller. Thanks for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time.